had kind of a serendipitous path to how I got to here. It's not where I intended to end up at all. I, um, as an undergraduate, I ended up as an independent major in science and religion. I was always really interested in science. I kept taking science classes, but they were never enough. I was never interested enough in just the science to only do that. And this was, was back in the day when you still got a, a course catalog. We called it the Blue Book. And every time I would thumb through it, the best courses always looked like they were in the religion department. And so I ended up taking religion and its critics in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and then I took a Zen Buddhism class and a class in medieval Christianity. I ended up writing, well, I ended up getting connected to Robert Pollock, who is a, a biologist, a virologist, but also really active in the Jewish community and had started a center for the science, for the study, the Center for the Study of Science and Religion at Columbia. And I ended up getting connected to him um, working with him and helping him with a book he was writing. And he became my advisor. And I ended up writing a senior thesis about medieval Christian conceptions of the physical world. And thought that I wanted to be a writer. Really liked the science part, was good at the science part, but didn't want to do it. Part of that was I also had a really great experience in college working in a genetics laboratory. Learned a lot and walked away from that knowing that I didn't want to work in a laboratory. And that seemed to me what science was. That was kind of my experience of science. And so, um, yeah, I thought I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to, to go learn about things, explore things, and write about them. And ended up, um, after a few twists and turns, working at the Natural Resources Defense Council, mostly because I needed a job. And NRDC is a, um, it's actually pretty big now. It's a, a national, a US-based environmental advocacy or organization. And their background is in, uh, as, a, as a legal outfit. And so they were some of the people that brought some of the first cases under citizen suit provisions of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And I went to go work for them um, through a bunch of connections and people um, helped me figure out that that would be a good place to work. And, um, I was doing public education for them. So people were asking me questions about anything. So everything from school kids asking about, uh, I have to write a report about muskrats. Please tell me about muskrats. Thank you. <laughs> to, I bought a hobby farm and it turns out that it was an illegal hog farm and now there's carcasses bubbling out of the lake. Please help. I've enclosed pictures. Um, so it was really this kind of amazing range of issues. And I had a couple big revelations for me while I was there. The first one of which was, wow, the environment. This is science that people care about. And for me, that's, that's been something that stayed with me throughout my education. Um, and throughout my career, because I'm, I really love that piece right at the intersection of biophysical constraints and realities and where they intersect with what we want and need and how we want to manage the world around us. Um, so working at NRDC was really fun and really exciting. It, became clear to me that I needed to start thinking about doing something else. Um, answering questions is fun, but only to a point. And I started thinking about what I wanted to do and came to the conclusion that water was one of the issues that we can't back away from. <laughs> that it's, we need water. We need water every day in our lives. We need water to make the things that we eat and that we deal with. Um, there's no, we can't pretend it's not a problem. It is, a, it is an issue. It is something that we have to face and think about. And that's, that's one of the pieces about thinking about water issues that was really compelling to me. 
I also spent a lot of time, I think the same thing is very much true about energy, for example, but I, I started trying to picture what my life would be like and realized that I was much more interested in the idea of tromping around in streams and rivers than going and checking out power plants, that that was the thing that was gonna work for me. And so there was sort of this personal connection bit as well as a real excitement about the, the drive and the importance of issues related to water. And I started looking for graduate programs and thinking about what it was I wanted to do. And I ended up going to Stanford. Um, they had a brand new interdisciplinary program in environment and resources. I was part of only the third cohort that ever existed in that program. It's still around and thriving. Um, and worked with some really phenomenal faculty members, did a dissertation uh, mostly working, mostly did my field work on the Big Island of Hawaii, looking at how does land management, conversion between forest and pasture land, how does that affect groundwater recharge, and what is the value of that change to the people who are using that groundwater aquifer as their water source, and might those people who are using the water actually think about compensating upstream landowners for certain kinds of land management so that they can improve their own water resources. And the idea behind this is sometimes called ecosystem services, sometimes it gets set up in systems that are called water funds or payments for watershed services. Um, and so what I really wanted to do was, a, was an interdisciplinary project that actually looked at what's the biophysical reality, what are the economic drivers, what's actually happening here. Um, Hawaii is an amazing place. It's also sort of a weird place. Um, geologically, the place where I was working, there was no surface flow. Everything ended up as groundwater. There were there was it was a fog forest, but there was also big storms that rolled in intermittently. And the what all of this really unique geological biophysical stuff ended up meaning was that while I absolutely was able to measure the impact of a land use change on water resources and actually put an economic value on that, the numbers were pretty small just because of the reality, the biophysical reality of this place. Um, also because of some of the, the economic and social things that were governing um, what the value would be. And so the whole project was really interesting. I got to do some great, some great field work out in the forest and in these pasture lands um, as a as a setup for kind of, this could be the poster child for we're, we're doing this project, we can show how you could invest in land management to improve your water resources. The outcome was, I guess in some ways disappointing, it would be great to be able to say like, wow, this was so amazing. But it was, I also think it was really, it was good and it was important to see that, you know, actually, yeah, well, theoretically that works in, in context, it's not that important. Actually, this is not this is not what's driving some of the important things that people care about here. Um, actually, water's not the thing that's the most important here. There's a whole lot of other values about land use legacies and about biodiversity that play a much bigger role here than water does. And that was a takeaway message that was really important. I moved to Minnesota about five years ago, and I came here to work at the Institute on the Environment, which is where I still am, and. I came to think about water and water use and especially agricultural water use at the global scale. So part of the reason that I did that is because I had been you know, really immersed in this field project thinking about plants and the water cycle and how plants affect the water cycle, but in this really specific place and I wanted to extrapolate that to make it bigger and think about what did this mean in other places. For, for other kinds of land use, what does this mean at the big scale? And so coming to think about global stuff after working in a specific place in the field was really exciting. And, you know, I'd worked in pasture lands, but I, I hadn't actually worked in row crop agriculture before I came here. But it turns out that indeed, you know, plants, plant physiology and evapotranspiration, it's more or less the same regardless of the kind of plant and so I was able to get up to speed relatively quickly and have since then been here working on 
water issues here at the Institute on the Environment. And what I really love about the work that I do here is that, again, it's right at this intersection of, of the, the biophysical with the social. And it's really about the why. Why are we using water the way we're doing it? What would it mean if we changed water in certain ways? How would that make things better or different? Um, so I'm thinking about some of this, the watershed investments and ecosystem services stuff in other parts of the world now, spending a lot of time thinking about water balances in watersheds around the world, how much water is available, how much of it are we using, what does that mean about water stress? Um, and I'm really interested in water productivity. So what are we getting when we use water? How much crop per drop are we getting is one piece of work that I've done. So I like to talk about that is how much food bang do we get for our water buck? And how does that differ in different places? And might we want to think about changing the way we invest our water and what we get out of it? And that's so that's where I am now. I never intended to be an academic. I had never even considered working on water issues. Um, but when I look back at it, 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 it sort of all makes sense, even from the, the questions about science and religion, and, and again, kind of thinking about this, this intersection. It's, in some ways, it feels like a really natural place to have landed, even though I never, ever would have predicted it. Do you and water go back? Always? I mean, can you find central water experiences in your, in your childhood and early youth? Interesting. Well, so my dad, both my parents are scientists. I think that's why I shied away from science to begin with. but. My parents, and especially my dad, is also a fly fisherman. So when I was growing up, we spent a lot of time by rivers, mostly up in the Sierra Nevadas. And usually, I was not in the river. The rivers are cold in the Sierras. So mostly, I was sitting by the bank. Sometimes I was reading. I spent a lot of time, especially when I was littler, creating worlds dollhouses for ants and critters across banks and with ramps and overhangs and um, worlds, lives, sort of next to rivers. And, and I do think about that as, as something that, that grounds me and feels comfortable. And I definitely always want to swim whenever there's an option. <laughs> What's happened to the religion and science symbols? I am personally not religious. Um, we grew up with the menorah in one room and the Christmas tree in the other. And uh, I never felt a strong personal urge towards religion. but. I have a lot of intellectual interest in religion because so many people find so much meaning in it. And to me, the thing that's really interesting is why? Why are we managing our natural resources the way we are? Why are we making the choices that we're making every day? And what do we, what do we want? And science can't answer those questions. I don't think at all. Um, to me, even something as scary as global warming the science doesn't say global warming is bad. The science says global warming is. It's the moral piece of the question. 
what are the impacts? Who's gonna get hurt? What's my responsibility? How do I want the world to look for my children and my grandchildren <coughs> and all these people I'm never even gonna meet? That to me is the normative part. And that to me is a part that's much more related to religion. Science is giving us information. Science is telling us about what potential consequences are and what potential options are. But the decisions about what, what we want to do and why are, are very human. And so moral is how I tend to think about them, moral or ethical. Um, but religion clearly is, is part of that. And that's why I think it's so interesting and so important. Back in your report on muskrat days, <laughs> you were writing for ordinary people with questions about floating pigs and muskrats. Uh, do you do any of that anymore? I do. I do, and I love that. Um, I do a little bit of traditional teaching. My job here at the Institute on the Environment is as a lead scientist. So I'm not a faculty member and I don't have regular teaching responsibilities. I do some teaching, guest lecturing and, and course development, but mostly what I do actually is outreach. So I spend a lot of time talking to all kinds of groups. I've uh, been out to a couple high schools recently, so talking mostly to geography students about food and climate change. And I've been I've met with a number of groups that are primarily retirees in the Twin Cities recently, and I really love talking to people in that kind of a in that kind of a forum, getting down to how do we get through, how do we interpret the messy technical stuff and get to the point. What matters? What do you need to know? I like the challenge of the distilling information to get it to something that's really clear and then presenting it to people in a way that they can understand what all of the really interesting um, questions are and they can make choices about those questions and, and consequences. Can you say a little more about what's contained in that lead scientist role? The first lead scientist I've talked to in 20 years, <laughs> I got to know what it means to be one. Well, I think the first answer to that is that um, I'm helping to define it as I live it. So I am a little bit of a, a unicorn in academia. We'll take the we'll take the positive spin and go with unicorn. Um, being a, an independent researcher in academia without being a faculty member is relatively uncommon, but there are some really interesting spaces for that at the University of Minnesota and especially at the Institute on the Environment. And um, so I'm kind of trying to figure out what it means to be a lead scientist. So there are elements of it that are similar to being a faculty member. I'm a principal investigator, so I help, I form collaborations and I think up important research projects and I write grants and every so often one of them actually gets funded and then I get to do projects related to that. Um, the outreach that I'm doing is part of my job too and that's something that I think is really important, really important for universities to be doing that our, our clientele in terms of education is much bigger than just the student body. So it's really fun to be able to represent the Institute on the Environment and the University of Minnesota as I go out and talk about issues that are really pressing to people. And I'm also doing some work trying to, to tie together members of the University of Minnesota water community. So there are so many people here who study water and water issues. There are people at St. Anthony Falls Laboratory who run flumes and do um, all kinds of modeling and mathematical modeling of how water flows and where it ends up and how deltas are formed. There are people in the humanities who are thinking about what does the Mississippi River represent 
Um, there are people working on filters and how do we clean water in better ways. You know, there's just this huge range of expertise, of really smart people. And both because of my position and I think also because I have this real passion for thinking about how do we bring things together, I think that one of the things that the lead scientist is and can be is somebody who tries to bring together this expertise to be something different and more than what each individual is. So not to replicate the amazing modeling or literary criticism that are happening in other parts of the university, but to try to leverage bringing people together and thinking about the why part. Why are we managing water this way? How might we want to manage water differently? What does it mean if we do something differently? What options are there? What options do people want? I suppose Goethe was the first lead scientist. Yeah. I mean, and nobody, nobody messed with him. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if I'm free from being messed with. But well, that was kind of, a, kind of the question I was getting to. I mean, if you're Goethe and you decide you want to study squirrels for the next five years, nobody fusses with you. You do squirrels. <laughs> you know, everybody just says, "Fine, he's into squirrels this year," and probably Albert Einstein towards the end could do pretty much what he wanted too. What kind of independence do you have, and what kind of dependence do you have in this role? That's a great question. It's certainly one that I'm navigating, and it's one that I suspect is, is evolving. Um, so I've been in this role about a year and a half now, and for the past year, I mostly haven't had a boss. <laughs> The director of the Institute on the Environment left a little over a year ago, and we've got a new one coming in at the beginning of September. And so I've had, in some ways, the really delightful experience of being almost entirely independent. I think, actually, that it's going to be good for me <laughs> to have a little more pushback. I, I think, in the end, as fun as it is to feel like your wings can spread as far as they can possibly reach is fantastic, but it also, there's a lot of potential for wandering in the wilderness. So I think as much as, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit sad to think of, um, it's actually gonna be really good to have a, a boss again and to think more in a more structured way about kind of the end product and where is, where is the work that I'm doing um, with the Global Water, Water Initiative, where is that actually going? Um, there are, you know, I think that there will continue to be quite a lot of intellectual freedom, even with a boss. It's more the, that there, I think, will be more structure. Um, there is, of course, another piece to the puzzle, which is the financial freedom, um, which is not certainly not lost on me. Um, I am not in a tenure track position. I do not have the kind of job security that faculty members at universities have. And a significant fraction of my salary is, some, is money that I'm gonna have to raise by writing grants and bringing in money to do that. And that has um, different but really interesting implications about freedom. So that there are elements of that that end up looking more like contract work. Um, I would never do contract work that I didn't think was interesting or important, but there does end up being an element of, well, this got funded, so that's what I'm doing, and it got funded, so I have to do it. And in that sense, there's a, um, I'm certainly not free to do anything that I want, but by and large, more than anything, it feels exciting. There are constraints and they're very real, but there are a lot of opportunities also. In this odd, possibly never to be repeated interval between directors, you've got to 
fully express yourself or begin to fully express yourself, say, what did you do? I, I published a decent number of papers. Um, I've been working on a bunch of different things. So some of them were really related to some of the watershed ecosystem services work that I did that's more closely related to my PhD. Um, doesn't fit quite as well into what's happening here. And so that's sort of a, a road that I went down that's been really fulfilling, um, but might not have been the one that a director would say that aligns best with what our institute goals are. Um, but I've also formed a lot of new collaborations. Because there was this freedom, I've been able to really reach out to people at nonprofits that are mostly here in the US, so the World Wildlife Foundation and the Nature Conservancy, but also with some international groups. So I've worked with the International Water Management Institute. I got to go to Colombo and work with them on a project putting together some guidelines for managing groundwater dependent ecosystems and ecosystem services in agrarian communities. Um, and I've done, I've done some work. I went to Israel and talked with fertilizer manufacturers about what, is, what does water productivity mean and how can good fertilizer management affect that. So there's been some, some really neat opportunities to say yes and go to travel and um, meet people and work on issues. That I think has been, I hope that that's something that continues, but that's been a really huge benefit of having this freedom. Great places to swim to. Yes, indeed. <laughs> well, and as you told the story, uh, there's, I mean, just let me recap the story of your research and your progress as, kind of as I heard it. There's this kind of reasonable idea of somehow or other paying the people what upstream to take care of water better than they do now at any given now so that downstream the water is better <laughs> and that, that I mean at that level is kind of a no-brainer I mean, it's sort of hard to think how one might fight with that um, at the same time uh, there's the question of how much good the upstream work's going to do for the downstream people, and so how much they might be willing to pay, or how much would it make sense for them to pay? Could it be economically viable? So you start out with that nest of thoughts, and you go to Hawaii. And you find out that it's pretty complicated. <laughs> you know, this is a weird situation. And, you know, the model sort of works, but it doesn't really grab hold in the way that makes for truly satisfying, you know, a 76 trombone yep. kind, of, uh, kind of parade. Then you come here, and your mandate is now to take up to go up to 30,000 feet and look at the planet. See, but, but the puzzle there is you had a, a fairly simple idea that you found amazingly complicated to actually get to, get to come to grips with the reality on a little island. <laughs> now your next job is, let's go to 30,000 feet. Well, 30,000 feet, you got all simple ideas. <laughs> and, and you unfortunately are in this weird position of knowing what happens when you sort of put on the yep boots and go into the rivers on some little island. <laughs> You're, yeah. yeah. So, so tell me how that is. <laughs> This is something that I've been thinking a lot about, which is not to say that I have a great answer for you. I think that the crucial piece is that you have to ask different kinds of questions 
at different scales. And if you don't do that, you're destined to be wrong. So one of the one of the issues that I wrestle with a lot is exactly what you were saying. This well, how much of a difference do people make to the water balance, to the water quality? How big is big enough? This turned out to be really complicated in this one place in Hawaii. People ask me all the time. I got a call last week from someone who's working on a climate change nonprofit. We want to bundle water with carbon. So how much is water worth all over the globe? And what are the extra services? And I spent 45 minutes trying to explain why this is really complicated and <laughs> why this was in some ways really unlikely to work in the way that she wanted it to. But I think that's, an, that's a great example of um, a kind of question that is almost impossible to answer at the global scale. What's the value of managing landscapes for water in different ways in different places all around the world? That said, people keep asking me, and so part of me feels like, well, someone's going to do a bad job of answering that question. It ought to be me. <laughs> but I'm still dancing around how to, how to do it. What I do think an appropriate question at the global scale is where, what, how much? So really questions about targeting. If you want to know where are the places that are most important, global, where should we, if we're going to invest, if we're going to target interventions, where do we go? What do we think about? That's what global scale analyses are great for. So I did, for example, some work looking at the global distribution of crop water productivity, so crop per drop turns out that there are a few places where the crop water productivity is really, really bad. Um, like if you think about crop water productivity on a range from A to F, there's actually a big chunk of places that are, you know, at F or below. So we can find those with a global analysis. And the way we find them is because if all you're doing is growing crops, how do you know if you're doing a good or bad job? How do you know if you're using water efficiently unless you can compare yourself to someone else? If you don't have a benchmark, you have no way of knowing if you are efficient, if you're doing well, if you're doing poorly. So with a global analysis, we can say, hey, this is what the range looks like. And we can even control for things like this is the this is what the range looks like in a place that has a climate that's pretty similar to your climate. And you're way on top. You're doing great, good work. We should emulate you. Or you're doing really bad. We should pay attention here. Doesn't tell you what you should do, doesn't tell you why this is happening. There may be perfectly reasonable reasons. What it tells you is, hey, these are places that are worth taking a look at. You're gonna have a hard time making changes in places that are already doing really well, but places that aren't, you're likely to be able to make a change and it's likely to have a big impact. And so the second piece of it is sort of the how much question. And as part of this analysis, what we did was said, look, what if we, what if we raised the floor up? What if we took all of those F students and made them D's. Like we're not trying to get them up to A level or anything, but like what if we just did a little bit better? And it turns out that the answer is tremendous. Huge amounts of food produced, huge amounts of water saved, and it really has an impact when you're down at the bottom and you bring people up. And so now not only do we know, hey, these are the places that we should look, but 
this is the kind of magnitude of impact there could potentially be. And to me, that's really exciting. Again, it doesn't tell you what you should do. It doesn't tell you what the right answer is, but it says, this is something that's worth paying attention to. And that, I think, is what's really critical about the global scale as opposed to the local scale. And you, it's not meaningful until you go to the local scale and actually do something, but it does provide really great context. So where can I buy the most calories for a penny? You have a reasonably good answer to that. <laughs> if I want to give a penny <laughs> and buy some calories... Well, I actually don't have a good answer for that because the work that I did was all about crop per drop, so calories for water. And one thing that this analysis didn't look at at all is what's the cost. So I often get into heated arguments with economists who are like, Crop per drop, you can't think about that. You have to think about total factor productivity. And there's all of these things that go into growing crops. And if water is not the one that is limiting for farmers, they're going to optimize something else. They're, gonna, they're optimizing the suite of things. And this is, they're not wrong, but one of the pieces that's really interesting is that water, very much unlike commonly marketed goods, so things like fertilizer or even labor, um, water is generally not priced. And so there tends not to be an economic signal of scarcity. And a penny's worth of water could buy you a swimming pool in a place where a lot of water was available, or it could hardly get you a measly sip if you were stuck in the desert. And so there, there are these really wonderful, interesting questions then about what's the value of water? And part of the reason that I like the crop per drop metric, even if it's not the perfect economic answer, is that it tells us something about efficiency. Um, it tells us about that bang for the for the water buck, if not the if not for the penny. <laughs> so there's this Saudi prince who recently re uh, announced that he intended to give away thirty two billion dollars on no particular timetable, and are you saying that? you wouldn't be in a position to take on an the agricultural wing of that. I could look into that. <laughs> I mean, but you, I mean, I mean, you could you, I mean, how much more information besides the information you have would you need to be able to say invest, invest massively in the appropriate research and whatever the research tells you to do here, here, and here? If the guy really has a global reach. If he really has a global reach, I think that we have actually quite a good idea of where a lot of those places are. Now, what the right thing to do is and what that investment should look like is a lot harder. Well, yeah, but I mean, it, it, but, but that's just a matter of hiring the 10,000 scientists who will come, who will apply as soon as he puts out a cattle call and sending them out to the engineers. Yeah. I mean, is that, so that's, that... So that's a, actually a great question and a great issue. Um, so one of the other really exciting things that I've been able to do quite recently was go to West Africa with a project that's looking at agricultural interventions and how do we make agricultural inter inter interventions in the Volta River Basin, which is most of Ghana and Burkina Faso, as well as some of the other countries that are around them. How do we invest in agriculture to improve agricultural productivity, to improve livelihoods, and to improve food security? How do we target those? What are the right things to do? Where should they go? And one of the things that's quite clear
clear is that while there are always more questions to ask and more refinements to do about the biophysical science, and some of them I'm very, very curious about, to be totally honest, a bigger piece of the puzzle seems to be very much about capacity. So if I come to your village and I put in a dam so that you've got a reservoir and a canal system and you can irrigate, that means that you can go cr grow crops all year long and not just during the rainy season. And this is the Sahel, so it's right between the Sahara and the rainforest at the southern coast of Ghana. And it's really seasonal and in the dry season it's really dry. If you can grow crops during that season that means you've got a whole second crop worth of income, there's clear benefits to it. One of the things that's been pretty clear is that in many of the places where these dams have been put in and these canal systems, something happens. Canal washes out in a flood, something breaks, something stops working, and the entire thing just gets abandoned. So at least one person said to me that in her interactions and conversations with government officials in Burkina Faso, their feeling was that for the most part, none of these investments in putting in dams and reservoirs had been successful by the definition of they continue to be operational for 10, 20, or more years after they're put in. So this is, these are questions that aren't without biophysical components. People are concerned about erosion and the dams silting in. Um, but it seems fairly clear that that the issues are a lot bigger than that, that these are about um, community infrastructure and governance and ownership and finances and all kinds of things that are much more important. I mean, we know how to make crops grow, right? You need water, you need fertilizer, you need pretty decent soil, you need some seeds, you need some labor, but we know how to grow crops. And so for most of the places where crops aren't being grown as well as they could be, the things that are limiting it are, are one of those inputs, but why is that input limited? Well, if we give fertilizer to farmers, then their crops grow more if they're fertilized, but is that sustainable? Are they getting, or do they have to buy the fertilizer so they get trapped into a system where they have to keep buying fertilizer and they can't actually get out of a poverty trap? There's all kinds of really important questions that there's lots of people working on in agricultural development that are really interwoven with some of these biophysical questions. But in some ways, as much as I hate to say it, I think are, are because obviously I think what I do is fascinating. Um, <laughs> I think these are, are in a lot of ways more, more pressing and more important, that we really need to understand the, the why. Um, and it's funny, as I'm talking about this, I mean, I do think this comes back to your science and religion question. This, this question about, well, why are people doing what they're doing? What's motivating them? It's, it's a question about not exactly science communication, but maybe science uptake. Scientists are railing about, we've learned these things, and yet they're not necessarily affecting policy. They're mostly not affecting policy. So what are the things, what are the questions that we need to be answering that will actually make a difference? I think that this notion of making a difference, I think of it from I mean, the way you were talking about making a difference a second ago was about long-term welfare of communities, of the communities that are there, mm -hmm. okay? 
and possibly also those people to whom their food gets marketed, because obviously if more stuff's grown, uh, you know, then there a lot of a lot of people are going to benefit beyond the farmers that are there. If you're looking for ways of improving how water is handled that will still make sense a hundred years from now. <laughs> Something like that. On the other hand, big corporate actors, <laughs> you know, first of all, corporations are, don't exist. What exists are uh, people with 70-year lifespans who are bucking for promotion. <laughs> and they need <laughs> results on that scale. <laughs> uh, I mean, I have a cousin who runs a million acres for Wells Fargo. Uh, you know, and I'm sure. He's very interested in how water's used. And he'll listen very hard to you about how water should be used on that million acres, but within the framework of industrial agriculture, large-scale production, and a particular timeline. He's not necessarily concerned about what it looks like 100 or 200 years ago, yep. but years from now. At any rate, he isn't, he's not paid to be right. concerned about that, so far as I know. I haven't actually been able to get him in front of the camera, I hope, to someday. So, how do you, what, what does that add to it, or how do you think about this, the, these, these, these kinds of different stakes, different criteria for success for somebody like you who's trying to figure out how to effectively use water? Well, on what time frame? Yep. You know? Well, I mean, the great thing about water is that you always get to try again, more or less. The, the water cycle is a real thing. And when you really overuse your non-renewable groundwater, that's that's gone and that, that ship has sailed. But for almost everything else, it's going to rain again next year or maybe the year after that. So I do like water because you do get to try again. Um, for me, I guess I see my role and especially my role because I'm in academia in a couple different ways. So one of them is that I am trying to think about the longer term and some of the harder questions that don't have immediate payoffs because there's not a reason for corporations to be thinking about some of those questions. Some of the, there are some important water related questions that I think corporations want help with and there are lots of ways in which the university is starting to to have that interaction and try to answer these kind of bigger harder resource management questions in conjunction with corporations and corporate America and that's really important and one of the reasons I think it's important is because coming from academia, it is possible to think about those issues with a wider lens, um, a longer time frame, a, a broader take on things. Um, you know, so for example, your cousin the farmer. If a farmer is thinking about water management on farm, Usually what they're thinking about is how much water am I extracting from a reservoir or a stream? How much am I paying to do that probably? And probably that's mostly an energy cost. And is it enough to make my crops grow? And if I, as a water resource engineer, come up and say, hey look, I invented a technology that's, that allows you to pump less water and therefore pay less and have your crops still grow, your answer is likely to be fabulous. Especially if, you know, I'm gonna think about the upfront cost versus the long-term cost and all this other stuff, but like, okay, that's, a, that's potentially a really good value proposition. But if I'm a water resource manager and I take a step back and I make my box a little bit bigger, I'm looking at the whole watershed that's got a couple different farms and maybe a city or two in it, 
Well, then what I'm thinking about is you, the farmer, have been pumping water out and putting it on your land and growing crops. And now you're still pumping water and putting it on crops. And if you're pumping less water out of the stream, that means right there where you were taking water out, there's more water in the stream. But the water that you were putting on your crops, some of it was evaporating, but some of it was flowing back into the stream. So downstream from where you are, does this new technology actually make any difference in how much water is in the stream and then is available for the cities or for fish or for anything else? And the answer in a lot of cases is no. And so as a water resource manager, if I understand that, then maybe I don't want to give you, you, the farmer, a subsidy for switching irrigation equipment. Maybe I do. There's reasons to think about keeping water in the stream in that stretch where it's gone. The water quality is probably different where the runoff comes back in, and that might be a problem for drinking water and also for, for freshwater ecosystems. But if what I'm really worried about is how much water quantity is available, then my motivation is going to be different than you're the farmer's motivation because I'm thinking about this at a different scale. And so what I really like to think about and what I really like to, to do is to think about how are these different, how might these choices be different, and what scale do we do we as academics and as, as honest brokers of information want to help people understand what the impacts of their actions are so that they can make choices about where they want to invest and what's going to happen in the longer run? Is there any place on earth, is there any country you know of that takes national responsibility for its water system? And puts together a combination of regulations and, and subsidies and penalties that looks at the, the countrywide water system. Is anybody doing that? So we're definitely out of my um, area of expertise here. I don't know nearly as much about the governance. Um, so I'm, I'm mostly going to punt on this question. Um, I will say that there are just anecdotally things that I sort of hear about and know about. In Israel, for example, water is really scarce. And so there's a lot of emphasis on making decisions about where and how to use water. They do use a lot of water for agriculture because being food secure is a really important value for them. Um, they have also done all kinds of really interesting research. Drip irrigation was invented in Israel. Um, one of the things, one of the side effects of drip irrigation is that you end up getting a lot of salt buildup in your soil. And that in turn causes your yields to not be as good. And so I was actually talking to some Israeli scientists who were saying that in some parts of Israel, there seems to be movement of desalinated water towards agriculture and using the somewhat more saline water from the Sea of Galilee for drinking water because they need the really low salt water for some of the agriculture. And I think that's fascinating because there's obviously a lot of energy cost to getting the desalinated water. But on the other hand, I think what it reflects is, is a a balance and you know toward to what you were asking about that there are competing needs and those needs are both in quantity and quality and so how do you fit these pieces together and how do you potentially share the costs of producing water in different ways while still providing it for everyone well do you see ultimately, I mean, 
is there, are there individual solutions to these projects? I mean, you can go out and talk to 4-H clubs and farmers union gatherings all you want and explain to them how the causal chain works and what effect their particular farming practices have on Breckenridge, you know, 10 miles down the road. But the incentives <laughs> Are all at much higher, and the comp and the comp competitive scheme are such that if they're going to stay in business, they're going to have to play the game that's being played. I mean, I just run, you know, tell me if I'm wrong about this. But if I, if if this is right, then the only people who are really able to take account of the big picture are the people who are in a position to set the incentives, yep. to set the limits. Uh, to, uh, in various ways, affect the rules of the game. Is that right? I think that's probably pretty fundamentally right. It's, you know, this problem is, this issue is much bigger than just water. I mean, it's related to the rules of the game for agriculture and agricultural production, for example. Um, There are, I actually, in a lot of ways, I'm very hopeful. <laughs> I've been watching what's happening in California, for example, with a lot of interest. Um, there's been, there's actually been a ton of movement and a ton of flexibility there. When you think about how, how much their water situation has changed just over the three three to five years that the reservoirs have been dropping. Um, you know, urban centers are demanding far less water because they're doing a lot of efficiency. And agriculture is changing. Agriculture is changing their practices. And they're starting to think about you know, fallowing and other ways to, to really conserve serious amounts of water. And it's not that there aren't situations that are really bad and of course these are the things you hear about on the news and, um, but overall actually California seems to be negotiating its way to if not a new normal at least a new functional until it starts to rain again and if it doesn't start to rain again I have every reason to believe that they will continue to negotiate their way towards what towards a new normal and the thing that I think is really that people are starting to understand and that's really clear is that no one's going to die of thirst there's there's plenty of water available if all you're trying to do is basic human needs the reason that there's pressure on water in California and basically everywhere is because of agriculture because of using water for irrigation that doesn't mean that irrigating is a bad thing. Irrigating is a great thing. Irrigating lets us grow more crops in more places. There's tons of reasons that we do want to use water for, for irrigation and for agriculture. But it also means that when we think about managing, we, we need to think about playing different pieces off against one another and not just managing each individual piece. So, I was the ruler of the universe and I was looking at places that are water scarce, I would think about, for example, compensating farmers to stop irrigating either in the short term or permanently um, as a way to ensure flow to cities or in places where freshwater ecosystems are important. Um, and trying to balance off different uses against one another instead of trying to make instead of trying to squeeze everyone a little bit i would think about basically moving water among sectors and compensating for that with something other than water itself so maybe that's direct cash payments maybe it's education so that you can do something other than be a farmer it could be all kinds of things, um, but most of the things that we use water for, 
we don't actually care about the water. We care about what we get from the water. So we care about growing food, or we care about producing widgets, or we care about um, being clean. The only things that we really care about water as water for are drinking and splashing around in it. And so that means that if we can find other ways to either get those things we need without putting water into it, or not put water into the, those things and get those things from somewhere else, either temporarily or in the long term, then there really are there becomes a lot more flexibility for moving around and thinking about using water resources better. Thank you.